Hello and good afternoon. Uh, well, I won't waste much time because we just have 40 minutes and I won't even waste time what you call narrating the, what the topic is. And you can call me Mac because my name is a little long itself. Uh, but interestingly, uh, I would just give you some example, some instance from my own family. It's not so far from what the topic is. Uh, my mom, uh, she's a 75-year-old woman. Uh, nowadays, for the past one year, I've been observing that she is uh, staying awake till night. I mean, she's a sleep early, get up early kind of a person. Uh, and what she's actually doing is basically uh, looking at videos of recipes of, or embroidery. And then a month back, she sends me a link. Uh, she wants to buy some stuff from Amazon, some sort of a kit. Uh, that's one end of it. And another end of it is my nephew, actually. He's a 20-year-old guy, uh, just out of college. And uh, he, we call him the Mini Chunyun Wala. Uh, he's already in, invested in stocks. Uh, he's learning about futures. And how, the way he's doing that, he's, he's basically uh, learning from a lot of financial creators on YouTube. Can you hear me? No. A little louder. Oh, sorry. Uh, should I repeat? So my nephew, basically, he's a 20-year-old he's a guy. We call him the mini junior wala. And uh, uh, what he's been doing is learning the art of investing uh, just by watching a lot of these creators on, on YouTube. Uh, he's also into the whole underground culture. He learns rap. Uh, and another example from, from my own family is my niece, actually. He, she stays in a very small town uh, called Hunavar in Karnataka. And she's already a big fan. She's just 10 year old. She's already a big fan of BTS. I mean, she sings those songs. Uh, she puts them as reels out there. What I also learned recently, I mean, I was just speaking to Michelle and I got to learn today that she's also a mommy blogger. Okay, I mean, uh, she has 15,000 followers. So my, my first question is actually to Isha. Okay, I mean, Isha, you are at the heart of consumer science. Yeah, uh, what I mean, I mean, what is happening in this landscape itself? I mean, Thank you, Mac, for giving that opening question. Uh, very excited to be here with the panel. Um, and I think you already opened up with giving examples from your family, right? From the age spectrum, what Mac spoke about right from his mother to your nephew, in terms of how they're consuming content. So to the question of ye ho kya raha hai, I think it's just that we are living in real life than real life at the moment uh, from what you spoke. And uh, giving a consumer perspective, and I'll bring in some numbers, uh, being, being from the consumer science side. Uh, if we talk about the world today, we are sitting with consumer creators at a tally of 50 million content creators. And for this planet Earth with 8 billion humans, that's a big number on content creation itself. So that's happening on the creator side and creative or creator economy, the way we would want to call it. And if you talk about brands, I think that it has never been a better time when brands wanted to create communities, when brands wanted to create more long-term effect of how they're engaging with the consumers and how much uh, they could sort of push themselves from being undifferentiated commodities to being very differentiated personas, right? So there, there, there's creation happening, there's a need for the brands, and on the other side, the consumer has started believing in purpose, which is what is the brand really standing for? What are you really giving to me from a short-term or a long-term perspective? You are selling this, but what are you actually doing? Because we are opening up to a generation of doers with Gen Z, Gen Alpha coming our way, right? So I think it's brand, consumers, and a parallel stream of creation, and it just converges like magic. There's a need, there is an offering, and there is consumption. So this is what is happening, which is the complete uh, explosion, which is giving rise to a creator economy like never before, if that sums it up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, thanks, thanks for that. Is it working? So uh, that comes to my second question, I mean, uh, to, you, to you all, in fact, is uh, are the lines blurring between uh, the content creator and the brand ambassador as the face of the brand? Could you hear me? I'll take it. Yeah. Uh, I'll put it like this. Is this audible? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, yeah so I, I would take it like this. I think uh, there was a time where 
um, to add on to what she said, right? Content was only created by a few and then consumed by all. Uh, we've moved from that to content being consumed by all and then created by all, right? I think that's where we are. Uh, and just to take an example, right? Uh, we work with brand ambassadors for our multiple campaigns. But today we also have a separate community called Pep Homies, which is a thousand plus large community of uh, you and I. I. I would put it as you and I because these are people who on Instagram have uh, 5,000 followers maybe, 10,000 followers, that's just you and I. Uh, and why do we have them? I think that's the more important part, right? Why did brands have ambassadors like you asked before? Is that we wanted reach, we wanted trust as in the previous session that was being talked about. Uh, what these people provide today is, if I see my friend talking about a particular brand and the experience that the brand provides to them, there's a lot more believability or there's a lot more association with that content. And which is where we started off um, in this journey with this community, right? And today what this community does is, like I said, there are thousand plus people who post every month, right? And I'm not talking about for a campaign, for a particular event. Thousand plus people posting every month. Uh, where the content that they provide and produce is a lot more engaging. Like if I look at the engagement rates of those content versus sometimes what even the brand produces, they provide exceptional content, right? Which is also because uh, it leads to the question who is providing and uh, making the content, right? Uh, we have a lot of people, a large chunk of these people are 18 to 25 year olds, right? Uh, there are moms who are 45 year olds plus right in the community that are working and some of these people are providing and producing content like never before and providing great engagement so yes uh, i think the lines are blurred but more importantly the question is uh, why do we do this and i think it's leading to good results from there uh, i'll just give a little different point of view because i believe it's a panel discussion so i was you should be okay you know uh, let's go back to old school uh, when we actually decided or we used to decide to get a brand ambassador, there was a lot of exercise that we did in terms of what does the brand stand for, what are the values that you stand for, what are the consumer gaps that you are addressing and therefore what is the messaging that and at the end, if that messaging required a celebrity, then the celebrity used to come in, provided the celebrity has a fit. The fit needs to be in terms of the value, in terms of reach obviously. There were a lot of things and there was a lot of science behind this art. Now what I feel is, as the lines are blurry, so is the diligence or due diligence as we finance people used to call it, used to call it, those are also blurry. So in an attempt to do something, in an attempt to have an influencer marketing strategy as a part of your overall brand arsenal, uh, those due diligence are probably taking a backseat. And what I believe is, uh, if not checked, this might actually prove counterproductive to the brand. While yes, uh, content creators and micro influencers and influencers are good, they should be tested and they should be used. But I still believe as an old school marketer that the values that a marketer brings to table, those values should never be compromised. Uh, I think there's some problem with his mic, uh, if you can just get it. Uh, Samyukta, I mean, uh, BPC, I mean, such a cluttered yeah. category, I mean, it's one of the categories which has one of, like, largest number of creators, right? I mean, I have handled BPC for six years, uh, handling Unilever brands. What's, what's your take on this, I mean? So, since it's a panel discussion, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, yeah, but having said that, um, I'd like to kind of marry what both of you said, because I think if I have to specifically take the example of what we've been doing. So we actually did a huge um, repositioning exercise last year. It was 18 years for Kaya. And um, we realized that there was a lot of legacy that the brand holds. It was one of the first to the market. It was a visionary brand. Um, there was a lot of authenticity in the way the brand has always been built. Uh, there was always inclusivity as part of the brand tenet. Uh, but I think the beauty of, and I think if I have to borrow from what you said about brands with purpose, yeah. right? And that's how the Gen Z and millennials today, they relate to brands that are authentic, that are real, that are honest, where the conversations are extremely real and honest. So yeah, if I have to marry it with what you said, Abhishek, there is a lot of 
effort that goes into, like you rightly said, what is the RTB, what is the USP, what does the brand stand for? Uh, and we realized that for us, the tenets is authenticity, and being real, being honest. Um, and that's where we said we will only work with collaborators who actually um, embody the spirit of inclusivity in, in their own lives. Uh, so we actually work only with collaborators or influencers from any sphere of life uh, who actually behold these tenets. And they are friends of Kaya. So they are the ones, their clients, their friends, they are people whom we actually actively collaborate with. The other big one that we have done, again, borrowing from what you said, we have 100 plus dermats. We have like actual qualified MD doctors within our ecosystem. And we realized who better than them to kind of, you know, create this entire influencer ecosystem. You spoke about, you know, creating a community. Uh, it took a lot, you know, because there are people out there who are willing to put themselves out and, you know, like you said, your niece is creating reels with BTS. And then there are a lot of doctors who are extremely old school and they're like, what, you want me to like dance in front of the camera and what are these songs and, you know, what are you making me do? So it took a lot to kind of, you know, start that journey and that's where we've been at, you know, to ensure that, yes, we are beholding the brand's tenets, but the voices are actually real and coming from the community. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll direct this question to Amit. Uh, Amit, in, in the FMC, FMEG segment, I mean, Cisco has come a little long okay. way uh, uh, from what it was. It used to be a LED manufacturing company to now you're into cool wearables. I mean, you're, you're into watches, you're into power banks, you're into grooming. I mean, uh, how would you see this uh, on, in your segment? I mean, so I, think, uh, I hope I'm audible. So I think the moment you hear the brand name Siska, you know, the first thing that comes to your mind is obviously LED lights, right? Because that's what, you know, uh, the journey was started with around eight to nine years back. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, we are talking about content creators, right? So I think for us, it completely depends upon uh, which segment you are, you know, addressing in terms of your marketing programs. And I think, uh, if you look at, you know, the little serious categories like LED and wires and fans, I think uh, there we are able to bring in the typical brand ambassador and put this uh, in the entire marketing uh, programs and, and serve the content to the uh, audiences, right? Now, when you look at the new age categories which you spoke about, like today, Siska is also giving you grooming appliances, um, you know, wearables, hearables, smart home products, etc. I think... Uh, in these categories, I think we have realized that it's not really important for us to invest huge monies in, in bringing the face to the brand because ultimately these guys, the millennials and the Gen Zs are still discovering you know, their passion, they're trying to identify themselves. So I think uh, uh, there are different mindsets I think you know, these guys bring. Uh, you know, so example, uh, look at uh, grooming appliances for example, right? So uh, uh, I remember you know, it was about you know, pushing uh, the, the, the very thought of, you know, uh, styling your facial hair, etc. And today it has just become a regular societal norm, you know. And uh, so while it is about, you know, uh, people to look good, at the same time it is also about people to feel, you know, very hygienic about, you know, what they are up to in life. So, you know, when you go to a regular gym, half of the time guys like are working out with huge weights and half the time they are, you know, actually self-admiring themselves in front of the mirror, you know. So I think now the terms are like manscaping, etc, etc are emerging. So imagine the mindset that I'm using is not only to look good, but also, you know, when you're looking at something which is beyond being looking good, right? My own dad, like I remember, he used to scold me ages back, right? Ki if I'm like getting delayed by a week or two for my haircut, he's like, kya holiya bana rakha hai? And the same man, he is now, you know, donning a pony. And I'm like, you know, what kind of double standard, right? So I think things are changing. Even in case of, you know, my wearables and hearables, um, I remember like, again, these Gen Zs and millennials are having various interests, you know, right from, I think, three, four years back, it was about using a lot of uh, wrappers for my content. Today to even fashion, because today uh, these uh, accessories are not only used for functional benefits, but also for their aesthetics. Mira airport look kaisa jayega, mira gym look kaisa jayega, mira office look kaisa ho jayega. So I think there are various, uh, you know, aspects that you need to address, um, uh, you know, when you're looking at a younger audience. 
नो इफ आई स्टार्ट इन्वेस्टिंग ह्यूज मनीज फॉर वेरियस काइंड ऑफ सेलिब्रिटीज आई थिंक ब्रांड का फिर ब्रांड बच जाएगा सो आई थिंक आई डोंट वॉन्ट टू यू नो सर्ट ऑफ फेस दैट थैंक्स थैंक्स नवीन विद कॉन्टेंट क्रिएटर्स ड्राइविंग सो मच ऑफ कॉन्वर्सेशन हाउ डू यू सी योर स्ट्रैटेजीज इवॉल्व और Uh, is this even changing the course of thinking that you're doing in advertising i mean uh, i mean i want you to paint a picture from your your uh, your industry perspective i mean yes yeah, so i'll just add to what he said and what couple of them added right uh, with by using an example so for this diwali when we had to reach out uh, for our diwali campaign the idea was to uh, like somebody said earlier some of these other mediums club to the brand ambassador ends up providing one reach to maybe markets where you are otherwise not present and along with what you are communicating done right builds trust etc right so for the diwali campaign we actually did the opposite right which is uh, what everybody does because we are talking about content on instagram and other platforms our campaign was actually around memes from instagram being taken to outdoor right so the format was opposite now when we took memes from mobiles to the outdoor Uh, of course one you've broken the format there but the idea was how do we you now provide reach to that so we actually had uh, saif and karina who are our brand ambassadors uh, enact various meme formats on various outdoors driving the brand messaging right so uh, uh, and that led to a lot of eyeballs and hence traffic and whatever else after that right so i think uh, both will coexist it's a question of what he said it's about uh, what kind of content do i want created with whom and how does it add back value to the brand uh, hence you will continue to see both coexisting is how i believe so uh, yesterday for example a video that we worked with one of our collaborators whom we call pep homies uh, ended up having 2 million views right and that's a person who has uh, not as many followers as anybody else so i see both happening both will coexist it's about how brands marry them both and take their journeys ahead we for our case um we are a furniture brand but we are also a home brand so we have furnishing decor a lot of these things when i work with maybe these pep homies is where they end up showing casing a lot of the decor we do a lot of furniture options furnishing when i take mainstream i talk a lot furniture right so that's how we play it's category content a marriage of all of them right i uh, samita you want to take this happy your views on this because you also normally channel brand uh, you have you are digital first but you also have a lot of studios i mean you have a lot of parlors right i mean you are entering the tier 2 tier 3 how do you see this uh, this this strategy evolving in your ecosystem of your brand so for us also i think it's very similar i think i'll echo what you said in terms of uh, yeah yeah you have to because there is there is no other option right i don't think there's any option and i think the uh, good or the bad is that today everyone is creating content like you said your 75 year old mom to your 15 year old niece everyone's a content creator today so um, i think for the brand it's amazing because what happens is that brands the onus of starting conversations even 10 years back was on the brand yeah. so the brand had to pick up topics the brand had to be cool the brand had to be relevant uh, the entire pressure so to speak was on the brand to kind of create outstanding content and put it out there today as a brand you can literally just participate in a conversation you could just you know peak eyeballs of a consumer who wouldn't have otherwise even looked at your brand and you could actually organically merely by merely by participating actually end up getting customer footfalls by not doing too much so i think that's the beauty of where the evolution of content is kind of going there's a lot of authenticity also happening i'm going to stick to that because that's where we are absolutely uh, but i think yeah that's a beautiful space that we are all in uh, i think but there's a long way to go i think the truth is none of us know where this is going because everyone's just everyone's just out there um, not to show where all of it is headed abhishek bfsi uh, as a category is very compliant uh, when it yeah, comes to this um, i mean is it something different that you see within your your strategies so uh, you know as you rightly said uh, makrand uh, mac that um, um, our industry is highly highly regulated uh, so that means that uh, suppose uh, we are doing this event and my company wants to put out a social media post yeah. saying that i was present over here 
we cannot do it like this. It has to go through a full process of approval, compliance and this thing and then it comes out. Uh, and that goes with every kind of initiative that we as a uh, company would like to do is and rightly so because this industry is prone to a lot of frauds and lot of uh, un, um, mis-selling and everything so regulations are required. What it does is it kind of stifles the creativity that probably we could have. But on the other end I also say that probably we use this ex or excuse to not uh, saying kuch kar nahi sakte because compliance will say. So what we try to do over here is um, we cannot use celebrities as such directly or my influencers to sell directly. Yeah. What we try to use influencers is a lot of driving positive engagement for the brand. I cannot sell through influencers that is not allowed. Because to sell an insurance you need a license otherwise you are not allowed to sell unless consumer decides to buy on their own through the web journey. And to give you a data point, in spite of all those advancements in people buying their own, across the country, uh, people buying insurance on their own is only 8%. 92% of insurance, I'm not talking about our company, I'm talking about the industry. 92% of the industry actually uh, buys, 92% uh, of sales comes when somebody is assisting yeah. an insurance buying process. And that person who's assisting needs to be licensed. So while influencers cannot sell directly for us, what we have actually realized is uh, these influencers help us to clear a lot of misconceptions around insurance. I can do a dipstick in this room right now and ask people that how many of you are adequately insured? And I know the answer, 99% of people would be inadequately insured in this room. In this room we are topic, probably talking about people who are more aware who are probably doing well in their lives and have disposable income in spite of that and aware of their responsibilities but in spite of that we are all underinsured including me. So what these influences and, and that was just an example, other problems that the industry faces is complexity, other problem is a lot of mis-selling has happened in the past, so uh, trust issues, trust issues with the adv advisor who is coming to selling you insurance. What influences help us is to bridge the gap over there and that is extremely important for the industry, extremely important for the industry and there they play a huge role. So um, if I have to classify between the two, we use micro celebrities and influencers to drive positive brand engagement and also to quell a lot of myths but large campaigns when we have to do where we are actually um, asking consumers to either go to our website or go to an aggregator website or contact an insurance agent, those kind of campaigns are normally driven through a larger than life celebrity. Okay, thanks. Uh, Amit, to you, I mean, uh, brands have been increasingly collaborating with a lot of pop culture things. I mean, whether it's sports, whether it's movies, whether it's entertainment, whether it's even like-minded brands uh, for that matter. Uh, I mean, uh, and, and this is all been happening to harness a younger audience for, in that sense. How are you doing that in your category or with your brand? So I think uh, for us it's uh, about, you know, discovering the uh, same, uh, you know, consumer mindsets which I spoke about earlier, I think. so. Uh, it's it's both ways like you know short term and long term both so example uh, from last i think 5 6 years this whole rage of uh, you know uh, grooming appliances and application products and specifically for men like you know they have like reached a you know beautiful peak i would say uh, you know so i think uh, there are these brands um, i can name them now example the man company so we collaborated with them because uh, they also are offering uh, a product which is kind of complementing the very category that we are also trying to tap, right? Which is about grooming and grooming men basically. Up pehle ke zamane mein shampoo sirf shampoo hota tha, ab beard ke liye shampoo hai, massage oil hai, and I don't know what not under the sun. So I think it's nice. I mean, like you know, like you have now so many choices <laughs> to look at. Uh, either you convince them or confuse them. Marketing mantra. So I think that's where it all stems into. But I think, uh, yes, we collaborated with them and co-created the proposition which kind of worked like uh, really well. So that was like a little short-term kind of thing I can talk about uh, wherein we offered them trimmers. 
but uh, example there is another brand um, peter england you right so uh, that brand is also known to go out and tap the same kind of mindsets right uh, the younger audiences today so uh, when they collaborated with us for a small pilot uh, they were very happy to you know uh, get the results across uh, their cat a and cat b outlets across the country uh, and basis that they actually got a lot of confidence uh, because of which they said ki theek hai uh you know first we saw you know the kind of reaction you know that your trimmers are getting for the brand peter england now we want to you know develop a product together with you so now you know we uh, have actually launched uh, a series of uh, trimmers basically keeping in mind the design inputs uh, of peter england so today the product not only has a sign off of cisca brand but also the logo of peter england onto it just to bring in more confidence so i think that's kind of a little long term that we have with them the association so i think it's it's both ways abhishek how are you doing it in, with, with uh, little ways yeah so why we can't do too much of co branding but uh, uh, what we realized is we are a financial organization um, and finance is going to be driven by the growth story of our country we are firm believers in india growth story and we believe india is at the cusp of when the compounding actually starts and when the compounding actually starts to kick in and that's when uh, disproportionate growth happens and we are at that cusp since we are believers in india growth story we also wanted to clearly communicate that we believe in india's future while there are many ways to do it we were decided to focus on a area which traditionally has been very neglected and uh, not much uh, investments coming into that area uh, and the area that we identified uh, was sports and within sports also very clear non cricket sports uh, cricket takes almost 99% of all the funds that are available in the country for sporting events uh, we decided to focus on the 1% which was and see if we can actually do something meaningful over there uh, so we are tied up with indian olympic association and uh, we actually sponsored the indian olympic team which had gone to uh, rio as well as which had gone to tokyo so the last two editions of indian olympics team which were gone uh, we were the principal sponsors of the team and as a part of that arrangement we were also sponsors of the team which had gone to commonwealth games and asian games of last two uh, inst instances why did we do it uh, number one is uh, because we wanted said that we believe we believe that like india is about to grow as far as finance is concerned even at sports while we are not at the cusp i think we still have a journey to come at the cusp and then disproportionate returns but i believe we have started that journey right now and at this point of time it is important for meaningful brands to come together and start investing in sports so while we have partnered with indian olympic association on the side we also partnered with top female athletes of the country uh we started with saina nehwal then we had rani rampal then we had uh, deepa karmakar mirabai chanu mary com uh, uh, hina siddhu the shooter and uh, hima das the athlete uh, the sprinter we started supporting them and we have been supporting them for quite some time so that's our way of doing something uh, do we talk about it not really because this is what something we inherently believe in but as a marketer it's i need to look at roi how does this help us from a marketer or from returns perspective as i was telling you we are essentially dependent upon trade my distributors we have 45000 distributors to sell life insurance for us this becomes a huge huge talking point with our distributors that you are associated with a brand which sponsors the indian team these distributors then go out in the market and talk to consumers because we are a challenger brand and i actually we are not even a challenger brand till now uh, 24 players in life insurance segment we are probably number 16 right now although we were 24 when we started because we are the youngest uh, but there are a lot of ground to be covered for us uh, so that really helps us from trade building perspective these kind of associations but why did we do it because we believe in it frank uh, samita are you doing anything in this direction i mean uh, building pop culture trends in collaborations there so for us again uh, after we did the entire rebrand and like i said it's always been part of the legacy so it's just about uh, putting the narrative out there you know letting people know that this is what we are doing one big initiative that we are all really proud of is the one that we did in march 
and that is something where we collaborated very closely with our HR team because we were very clear that as an organization or as a brand, we can't be doing lip service. Yeah. So we wanted to work with the transgender community. So for the first time, we got the community to write the script. So usually as brands, you get uh, scripts are written by the agency partners. It's approved by the client. That's typically how it works. But in this case, we actually co-created the entire campaign. It was shot with the community at the location of their choice. They handpicked who would be in the, in the film. Uh, it was directed by them. There was a voiceover artist who was from the community, an influencer from the community who wanted to be part of the campaign. Um, so the entire thing from scratch was created by them and the script that we approved, they actually dissed it. So then we, we got them only to write the script and then the script was also created by them. Uh, what we did with our HR was we actually tied up with an organization uh, that actually does sensitivity workshops and trainings, helps in um, placement and job opportunities. So we actually hired people from the community. So it meant we didn't realize like for us, the learning was so huge in terms of, you know, even understanding terminologies, how do we kind of behave. Consumers had to be trained, uh, staff had to be trained, everything. There was like a proper six month rigor that went into it before we actually went live with the campaign called Beauty and Safety. Uh, so for us, actually doing that level of collaboration after we hired somebody, that person started working with us, is when we kind of went live with the whole thing. So we've been trying to do a lot of these kind of meaningful you know, like you are talking about community impact uh, changes. Uh, because for us, clients have been coming to us from all walks of life. Clients have been, it's not primarily a women's brand. It's been a brand that's, you know, like you spoke about men, men's grooming. We, are, we have a lot of athletes, we have a lot of, lot of people who are, you know, uh, Bollywood stars and, you know, we have a lot of people who are models. Or like you rightly said, today everyone is very evolved. Everyone wants to look and feel a certain way. Um, so then opening it up, I think putting those narratives out there is what the beauty of digital is kind of doing for all of us today. Uh, Naveen, you want to uh, say something on this? I mean, how are you doing this? I mean, uh, So I think two ways. One is the kind of collaborations that we work on which are meaningful and add back to what the brand is, which is uh, uh, rightfully uh, as mentioned by everyone, right? I think, uh, for example, we work with this community called a typical advantage they are uh, largely uh, they work with persons with disabilities and provide uh, a form of living to all of them right and one of the ways we engage with them is for example we engage on art and paintings that they make okay they come forward and one anyways they engage through our platform sell etc but for example the last independence day or the republic day when we do uh, what we actually did is we went ahead and uh, gave our entire we have today's studios or physical stores across the country, right? Uh, we gave that as a canvas for them to come and display their art and actually our community of consumers engaged with them as they made this, became a part of it. Uh, it's just about, I would say, not inclusivity as, inclusivity as much as involvement. I think everybody got involved in it. So that's one form of, I mean, like we said, I think we don't, it's not something we talk a lot about, but we work with these folks because uh, it's about partnering in that journey. The second, I mean, it's a slightly, totally diverse side that I'm talking about also is where you started off with, which is uh, collaboration on content, right? Uh, that's another side which interestingly that I see today is also while we work with brands to build it up, etc. So for example, we work with India Circus, who's a partner together, create content, etc. What's also increasingly happening today, I think, is brands are working with brands on content. Yeah. And I'm not even talking about product now, right? I think, uh, let's just go back uh, one month, there was... Wakanda Forever releasing as a movie uh, because it's pop culture and all of that, right? And you saw uh, a lot of brands getting into that moment and talking about it, for example. Uh, it also involved Marvel reaching out to brands to say work with us. So what, what, what I've also seen today is a lot of brands are working with other brands because let's say I'm a community of, uh, let's say, 25 to 45 year old NCCS A segment working who's purchasing furniture with me. And there's another brand which is looking to reach out to them for, I don't know, movies for that segment, then the brand reaches out, like Amazon reaches out to another on content and promote. So I think that's an, another trend that I see happening today, which is brands working with each other uh, cohesively to, you know, build content as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, my another question is brands are building a lot of IPs. I mean, uh, they are building sustainable IPs. I mean, there is Asian Paints, there is uh, in the world of decor. 
uh, for that matter. Uh, and at, at the same time, you're seeing creators becoming brands, right, in some form or the other. Uh, my question is, should brand become publishers? Should brand become creators? You know, I mean, your point of view on that entire thing. Can I go for that? Yeah. I almost thought you've forgotten me on the no, panel. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, I think talking about IPs, uh, bringing it in from a consumer science perspective again, uh, I think that anyone who wants to create today or wants to stand for something has to create content and has to have an IP. Uh, I, gone are the days when IP used to be something very serious. Uh, IP is a way of uh, expressing thought leadership. It could be anybody, it could be any category, it could be B2B, it could be B2C. Uh, we are a consumer science firm. Uh, we really don't need to create an IP. We're a market research agency. Agencies never create IP. But then uh, very recently we thought we'd create a podcast because a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the people in our industry, uh, we have been just taken as you know, featured in size. We'll talk research. We'll talk statistics. But we thought, OK, we have to make it more scalable, more palpable. So let's create a podcast because that's a way of showing a researcher, which is the tenet. Uh, of uh, what content we want to sort of speak about. So I think as long as the relevance, as long as the why we are doing it is in check, then IP is something which is agnostic to the sector that we are in as a brand. And then nomenclature is only a thing. I think it's, it's not about whether you're a brand, you're a content creator. As long as you're creating a social connect to sell and to create consideration set for yourself, IP is something which will just get normalized as we go ahead. Yeah. I think just to add on to that, I would say, uh, especially for brand owners, uh, try to own the IP. Don't go as a naming partner to the IP. Never do that. Never do that. Uh, because if the IP is with somebody else, tomorrow somebody is going to outprice you and you will lose the, all the efforts that you have put in creating the IP. So I am a firm believer of if you are creating an IP from a brand perspective, please own the IP. Never go for a licensed kind of an IP where the owner is somebody else. Uh, Naveen, this question is to you uh, and, and specifically in the, in the world of decor or even some Yukta can add to it, is, is the whole use of tech-led uh, content to kind of uh, define the consumer journey or enable him in some form or the other. Would you like to talk about what's ha what are you guys doing in that world? Because you have an offline presence and then you have an online presence. Uh, how are you, and, the, and the journey for a consumer is, is uh, the gestation period is quite uh, long, right? For, for him to from to decide to kind of buy. How are you enabling that part? Um, so I'll, I'll talk about content as a part of commerce now, right? And fundamentally how that moves. Uh, for us, when we started off on this journey 11 years back, uh, furniture was never sold online, right? Where we are today, even today, 85% of the market shops from unorganized, which is your carpenter or a nearby shop. And I'm not talking online now. I'm talking about only really unorganized, right? Now, the challenge we had back then when we started off was how do we really enable this journey? Why should somebody buy a uh, highly non-standardized, high-value product online? We had mobiles, we had mo books, and we had now fashion. But why, why buy a highly non standard high value product online? Uh, to enable this is where actually technology came into play, or uh, content which would really enable that, right? And which is where AR came into play. So for example, uh, when we kicked off on our journey on AR, uh, what we did is today for a consumer who's sitting in their home looking to buy or make that decision whether this red sofa is great for my home, uh, what AR does is you could place it against that yellow wall in your home, against that photo frame you have, and decide whether this fits there, right? So uh, technology came in as an enabler to make this decision today. Where we are sitting today, one in five add to cards that happen on our website happen through somebody who's either used the AR feature or the 3D feature to make that call, right? So one is this, I think technology has been an enabler to fast track this journey. Today, if you go to our studio uh, where we sell furniture, like I talked about, we have about 200 plus studios in 100 plus cities. We don't sell any of the furniture pieces which are in the studio. The entire sale happens through the tab or the device in that store, where because we believe that in a 6,000 square feet, 2,000 square feet, what is the maximum number of products you can show? And we have 1 lakh plus products to show, right? So the entire journey happens through the device where this entire discussion happens. So I believe, uh, and the next projects we are working on is VR-led, et cetera, right? 
So the idea is, yes, to answer you, content has been a strong enabler for commerce for us. And hence, we today look at, if I am just pushing this ahead, is uh, what data today also tells me is if I have a banner on my website which has got uh, major yellow shades as against red shades, how does that move on click-throughs, right? So yes, I think uh, we are, thanks to the power of technology today, have a lot of data points to take calls on. What should be the next content that you create as well? Yeah. I think uh, I'll just add to what you said, very true. Uh, because even we are in a similar space where it's, in that sense, the services are high ticket value, not our products. But uh, the services also today, a lot of people are more evolved, more aware. Not evolved, but the consumer is more aware, so to speak. Yeah. Like, for example, even 10 years back, um, all of the things that you're seeing today in the front of pack, niacinamide, salicylic acid, like these are things which would have been something some R&D scientist in a lab would have, uh, you know, been well versed with. Today, our Gen Z will be able to tell you the difference between, you know, 0 0.5 versus 1% versus 2% and how it's going to impact their skin. I think that's a huge difference in terms of how the consumer mindset has also evolved. And with that in mind, I think brands also got very cognizant uh, you know, during the pandemic, during the lockdown to kind of ensure that I think everyone has a very active D2C platform. Yeah. Everyone is active on e-commerce, you know, industries that you would have never imagined, like furniture, you know, or, you know, services. Uh, all of these had to kind of get onto the bandwagon because there was no choice. So what we would have taken us three years to learn, we were forced to learn in maybe three months, three weeks because there was no other option. Conversational AI became something that everyone had to kind of create bots. These were things that I remember during the lockdown, it was more like, let's figure it out. Who are the agencies? Who's doing what? You know, it, it kind of became that kind of a hustle. Today, it's become more, more commonplace. Today, it's become a way of life, you know. And um, even for us, for example, we have an AI skin assessment tool that's there on our D2C platform. It's also beautifully utilized within our clinic ecosystem where our dermats are actually able to, you know, like Naveen, you said, all of the selling is happening through the tab. So imagine you walk into the clinic, you know, they take a picture, upload it, and then they're able to kind of more scientifically, technologically kind of tell you, you know, exactly what your issues are and how it, how it can be treated, because that's a power of technology. It can go much deeper than the human brain can. And I think, yeah, somewhere it is all a marriage of online, offline, tech, human intervention. It's all kind of very beautifully coming together today for brands, like you said, agnostic of categories, yeah. Uh, my last question, I mean, uh, they have requested me to, that the time is over, and I, like I said, it's a very long session, uh, is to you, Isha, I mean, uh, and it's, it's the most pressing matter today, I mean, the measurability of uh, content, okay, uh, and content projects, or branded content projects in that sense, whether it's short term or long term, that's, uh, is, is the applicability of this uh, left to, like, a gut or intuition? I mean, that's a good one, because... I think that we have sort of content and people who use content has long sort of left the trajectory of gut. I think we all have already forwarded ourselves to gut plus. So there definitely is science, there definitely is method to the chaos, uh, be it in terms of choosing the kind of content that you have to create, which marries with your brand ethos. Uh, fair enough of testing is done by our brands. Most of our clients that we work with, uh, there's enough pre-testing in terms of what collaboration to go for, what content creator to choose. Because I think Abhishek, you mentioned that the brand values and the method and science still has to remain. Brand ambassadors could be content creators or vice versa. So that still stays. However, I would say that it's just become easier to sort of break the funnel into top funnel and bottom funnel. Uh, there is a long-term strategy where you would want to still continue to build reach and salience, your long-term campaigns that keep on running. Uh, you definitely have content as a tool to straight away impact imagery, which I think has become easier. So if you are a brand who wants to shift from a positive to a negative or a negative to a positive trajectory, sorry, wrongly put, uh, say example, Victoria's Secret, they use beautifully the power of content to uh, have the challenges that, that they were facing uh, from the body shaming piece and they beautifully did that reverse around uh, trend from content creation. Uh, we, we've seen Starbucks, uh, they have a beautiful employees page, just to employees, you know, what they're doing a day in a Starbucks employee to just convey what they stand for. So the imagery positioning in terms of measurability has definitely changed in terms of what content can sort of bring to you. 
and there is also a fact that uh, the funnel which is the conversion from awareness to uh, purchase it would be very wrong to say that that has not shortened in certain categories uh, on the basis of an instagram post or a reel alike consumers are tempted to engage and immediately purchase which is they become they become aware about a brand and that's for the pop culture categories that's for emerging categories like i'm a new mother i have a 3 months old daughter and i think the number of brands that i would have purchased just because i saw a instagram post versus what i knew about parenting there's a huge difference so i think in terms of measurement there's enough science there's enough method to it and brands are moving towards checking in relevance checking in the why and most importantly choosing that they don't go for content creation just for the heck of it but more so because it's bringing in those imperative gains and moving the funnel from sales to purchase and it's important in the customer journey uh, so to say uh, thank you i mean uh, thank you for all the inputs all the learnings all the insights uh, i would like to end this session uh, uh, by saying that uh, the consumer is a teacher okay and uh, the marketers are students and content is like a, the never ending curriculum uh, that you are learning you know? so thank you all i mean thank you all for being here and giving your time uh,